Did you say I was at the New Yorker? I was at the New York Post, which is quite different. <laughs> I, I have to admit, um, yes, I was at the New York Post for 26 years and I lived to tell the tale. Um, okay, so when I agreed to do this, I had no idea there was a theme. I didn't know anything about one simple rule. And as a journalist who's covered rock and roll musicians for four decades, I can tell you there are no rules in rock and roll. Um, and nothing is simple either in rock and roll. And I got into it completely by mistake. This thing is really freaking me out with the time. Um, at any rate, I got into it totally by accident. Um, and I like to equate my career somewhat with Keith Richards, who said that his career was a complete lucky accident. Mine was totally different because I didn't meet Mick Jagger on a train station when I was 17. However, I did listen to a guy on the radio in 1969 who had the sexiest voice. His name was Richard Robinson. He played unbelievable music on WNEW FM on the graveyard shift. It was from midnight to six in the morning. And I would listen to this and I would think this guy is amazing. He was playing Ike and Tina Turner and Otis Redding and he got fired because they said he was playing unfamiliar music, which at that time meant black music. So he got fired then they hired him back again then he was playing Iggy and the Stooges in the Velvet Underground, and they fired him again. <laughs> and the third time they brought him back, he played Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner, and they fired him because he played an unpatriotic song. So I thought, this is my guy. I gotta meet this guy. And I went to a Janice, I'm really dating myself, but too late for that. At any rate, so I went to a concert at Hunter College and this adorable boy came on stage with hair down to here and it was Richard Robinson and I said, oh, that's the guy I've heard on the radio and I inquired about him. I was just out of school. I really didn't have a job and I asked somebody, do you know Richard Robinson? He works in the music business. I'd love to work for him. I literally went, had an interview with him he hired me for $25 a week to do his filing. And my mother said, you're crazy. This is never going to lead to anything. You can't work for $25 a week. And I did. And then he hired me full time for $100 a week. We got married three months after we met. <laughs> I'm still married to him today. <laughs> Wait, I do have to say. I know that always, why does that get applause? Like it's some huge accomplishment. The, the major thing about my marriage, in fairness, is that I've been on the road with rock and roll bands since 1971. So basically Richard and I pass each other in the hallway and I really feel like, mm, I haven't really been married for 45 years. It's really more like 22. <laughs> At any rate, I went to work for him, he told me, that I could write a column that he was writing in England in Disc and Music Echo. It was a little English weekly, music weekly. And I said, I don't know how to write. I've never written in my life. And he said, you know how to talk, you can write. And so I started writing what is essentially was a gossip column in England. And bands like Led Zeppelin, who were getting terrible press in America, wanted me to write about them and come on the road with them. And I didn't want to go with them at first because I had heard they were really ruffians and they were raping and pillaging their way through America and they were drug addicts and all of this, of course, was true. Um, <clears throat> but I got convinced to go on the road with them. I went to Jacksonville, Florida. All of this is in my book, which you could buy at the desk. Um, <laughs> but I went to see them in Jacksonville and I was blown away by the music. I was the only person, I think, at that time who liked their music in the rock press. I also have to add, I was the only woman in the rock press, really. It was full of, um, yeah, you know, I, I have to say, I guess I did break a rule because I was a woman in a boys club. I mean, 
All of us are, let's face it. On the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, rock and roll was really a boys club at that time. It was the Rolling Stones, The Who, Led Zeppelin. I mean, there were wonderful women singers and musicians. It was Dusty Springfield, Tina Turner, Janis Joplin, and so forth. However, it was a boys club. And rock journalism was a boys club. And I kind of fell into it by accident. I wrote this one column in England that led to another column that led to another column. The New York Times Syndicate picked me up. I had a radio show, a cable TV show. I edited several rock magazines. I started working for the New York Post in 1999 when I no longer could write for the New York Post because the politics just were not mine. And I went to Vanity Fair where I've been since that time. And so I never got out of this world and I really fell into it. It was an accident. So I guess I broke that rule because Richard opened that door, I walked through it, and I never looked back. Um, other rules that I broke, I guess, were that I didn't do normal interviews. I still don't. I believe in talking to people, finding out what they're like, honoring if they say something's off the record. I kept things off the record if someone said it was off the record as a result. And this wasn't planned, it wasn't crafty, it wasn't manipulative. It wasn't manipulative. I just figured I should respect them. Don't ask questions I wouldn't want asked of me. But as time went on, people got to trust me more, and I got better stories, and I had all access. And I went on a Rolling Stones tour in 1975 on the entire tour. I didn't sleep with the musicians. I didn't take drugs. Well, um, uh, maybe a little marijuana and some wine. But other than that, I didn't take drugs because I wanted to get the stories. I wanted to keep the notes. I wanted to get the tapes. And I wanted to be coherent and lucid. And most of the women around rock and roll at that time were groupies, and I certainly was not that, and it wasn't even an issue, never came up. I didn't conduct myself that way, there was a respect there, I was into the music. One of the reasons I liked Led Zeppelin so much is I heard Eastern music and the blues and all the stuff that they were trying to do that the male rock journalists in America didn't respect, they thought, they were a cheesy heavy metal band. And here we are, what is it, 40 some odd years later, and they're considered one of the greatest rock bands in the world. But I had a really tough time writing about them, and I had a tough time writing the kind of stuff I wrote, which was gossipy, chatty, feature-oriented. I never reviewed anything. I still, to this day, find it hard to I don't know, how do you review a Van Halen record? I just, I never, I, I couldn't do it. It just wasn't, I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about reviewing art anyway. When you read book reviews, they give you the book report. They tell you the whole plot of the book. I don't know, I just to me, I was more interested in the personalities. I wasn't interested in asking formulaic questions. I didn't want to know which do you prefer, the studio or the road? I mean, I didn't go in with a list of questions. I just was sort of talking to people like I was interested in them. And as a result, my career, such as it is, sort of escalated to the point where I'm still doing this. And so I'm trying to think of one simple rule. I mean, there's a few. First of all, I never get up before noon. I never got off that. <laughs> Nothing happens in the morning. <laughs> um, I put a lot of ice in wine because it helped me keep drinking with them all night. Amber was looking at me before. She said, are you making sangria? And I said, no, I dilute it so I can keep up with people. And if I have to pick one rule other than breaking the rules and that nothing is simple, I would say, back up your work. And this is how, 
No, I'm really serious about this, and I've taken it to extremes. And this time we're still on 14 minutes, so I don't know how long I've been talking. But I will tell you that I always interviewed with this kind of a tape recorder. This is an artifact from the previous century. Um, it is a Sony cassette recorder. Believe it or not, on Amazon you can still order cassettes. And so I would go in and interview John Lennon or Michael Jackson or Freddie Mercury or Jimmy Page or anybody that I talked to with this one tape recorder. And I once went and interviewed John Lennon in 1973 when he and Yoko moved to New York. I took this one tape recorder, I got home, nothing on the tape. I either was so nervous that I forgot to press the record button or the tape screwed up and something jammed, but there was nothing on the tape. And I was completely freaked out. So I called him and I said, listen, um, I'm really sorry, but I screwed up the tape. And he was a doll. He said, oh, don't worry, love. Come back tomorrow. We'll do it again. However, I never let that happen to me again. What I did and what I still do, and it is compulsive and anal and crazy, I take three of these things. <laughs> I take three of these, and I have two of them with external microphones and one without. And I set them all up on a table, and that's how I do my interviews. And once when I was talking to, I think it was Beyonce or Kanye or both of them, looked at this setup, and they said, did you ever think of moving up to digital? <laughs> and I am a tech moron. I have a BlackBerry with a wheel on the side from 1992. I have a flip phone. I use these tape recorders. And so I went to my husband. I said, Richard, do um, you think I should try a digital recorder? Oh, I kept calling it a digital tape recorder. <laughs> and he said, it's not called tape. It's just digital recorder. So he set one up for me. He drew me a diagram, like I'm five years old in kindergarten, like press here, turn this. And I went to interview Lady Gaga for a Vanity Fair cover story. And I was at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I set up these three, my usual. I wasn't going to count on that digital one. So I took these three, and I took the digital. Guess which one didn't work? <laughs> Really, it didn't work. I brought it home. Richard turned it on. He said, what happened? I drew you this diagram. It was so... So anyway, I take three of these. But the backup doesn't stop there. I am absolutely amazed at this generation. I've talked to so many kids who do interviews with iPhones. People write entire albums worth of material on laptops. Have they not heard that things can crash? I mean, iPhones, St. Vincent told me she did a whole bunch of songs on an iPhone and then she lost it, I don't know, in a toilet or a bathtub or in a river or something, or back of a taxi cab. And I just think, how can you do all this work and then not back it up? So after I come home with the three tapes, Richard takes them. He dupes them on to his hard drive, or whatever that's called, on a computer. And then he makes copies on something that I call a CD, but he calls something else. And he makes two copies of that. Now, this doesn't always work, by the way, because once Joni Mitchell recently, like last year, called me on the telephone, and I wasn't expecting her to, and I was doing an oral history of Laurel Canyon, and I had waited for her to call me for a year. And so I raced to the telephone, and I plugged in something in the wall into one of my phones, which looks like something off the set of Mad Men. It's literally a, it's a black table model with five push buttons and a whole... Anybody here who's maybe been around for a while would remember that phone. Um, and I plugged it into the wall, and I taped the interview with her, and I was just praying that it was OK, because I wasn't going to get her again. I knew it. And we had that one tape. Richard duped it. He then made two CD copies of it, put it on the hard drive. He added it to my 10,000 CDs 
that I have that are backing up my 5,000 cassettes in my six storage spaces, which, uh, th mind you, that's not cheap to keep six storage spaces going for however many years I've been doing this. And then I also have someone transcribe it, so I have paper. Then I Xerox the paper. So this is all so kind of crazy and anal and compulsive. And then when I needed to find the Joni Mitchell tape, I couldn't find it. <laughs> but however, even though my six storage spaces look like an episode of Hoarders, and even though I'm still using these archaic tape recorders, which are hard to find now, and cassettes, which are hard to find now, I have found that for me, the simplest and most basic rule is to back up your work. And I think that anybody who is writing anything, I mean, people keep emails that they shouldn't be keeping. They keep sex tapes that they shouldn't be keeping. They have photos of their food, their dogs, their children, their vacations, but they don't back up their work. I think it's just kind of crazy. So the only thing I can say to someone who is starting out or writing or even writing a letter to a lawyer, I would say back it up. That's my one simple rule. Thank you. Thank you.